Welcome in everybody to the flagship podcast. I am Chip Brown of Horns247.com. Joined as always by our fearless leader, managing editor, Taylor Estes. Taylor, how are you doing? I'm doing well, Chip. How are you doing? Well, I'm excited. We were at football practice today, today being Tuesday, March 29th. Um, how was your birthday, by the way? It was good. I didn't really do much. Um, just kind of laid low, but it was nice and relaxing. So okay, yeah. good. Yeah. Good. What happens when you get old? You don't have very fun birthdays really <laughs> anymore. Right. You're not going to Sixth Street and getting all crazy. Oh. You're just enjoying a quiet night. Yes. Going to Sixth Street would probably lead to like a week of recovery if I actually yeah. did something like that. I think the last time I went out on Sixth Street actually was my bachelorette party back in the day. And it was, we had a convention in Vegas. Remember that? Uh, when Scout oh, yeah. owned us. Yeah. And I had to go straight from my bachelorette party to Vegas. And I was sick as a dog for about a week after I got back from Vegas. Like terrible, terrible time in bachelorette, then Vegas with all the dudes uh, in our network that like to party. So, <laughs> oh, yeah. Those were the days. Those yeah. were the days. Well, these are the days for this uh, Texas football team. We are. We've just completed spring practice number four and um, some interesting comments from Steve Sarkeesian today. We'll get to who's looking good, where and all that. But Steve Sarkeesian, I thought, um, had some interesting comments about his concern for the lack of depth on offense that, you know, they didn't even scrimmage on Saturday because he's just not sure how much he can give uh, to the offense right now because of the lack of depth at positions like offensive line and receiver. Now, I don't know what that says, Taylor, about the guys who are behind Jordan Whittington, Xavier Worthy, and Isaiah Nayor, that um, they are considered part of a position that has a lack of depth. I'm talking about guys like Marcus Washington, Calvante Dixon, you know, Dejan Harrison, um, Casey Kane, but let's be honest. They don't have a ton of depth at that position. We right. know that Calvante Woodard transferred out, Josh Moore transferred out. Um, and Jaden Alexis is still working his way back from, uh, his knee injury from last year. So, um, you know, that that seemed like Steve Sarkeesian was genuinely concerned, didn't it? Yeah, I, I totally agree with that. I mean, and and um, I mean, this is going to this has been kind of an issue going into spring football. So it's a little surprising that it's he, you, you know, talked kind of at length about it being a concern because I feel like it's been a concern for Texas. But I, I think the biggest surprise, Chip, is that. I mean, if you watch the drills go through, you know, it's um, it is uh, Xavier Worthy, Jordan Whittington and Isaiah Nayor like that get the first three reps. And like Calvante Dixon's like way down, way down in the rep count there. Um, same with Marcus Washington and, and, you know, in the limited views that we did see of practice. And, you know, we've talked time and again on this podcast, Chip, about how the time is now for those guys to really step up. I mean, they've been on campus for several years now, and I know that they haven't you know, had extensive, you know, playing time or consistency in the same offense. There's a lot of things that they've gone through, but you expect when a guy's been on campus for at least three years, that a light bulb, it's either going to turn on or it's not. And at this point, you're kind of wondering, is that light bulb never going to really turn on for the two of them? And especially, I think the two of them, and, um, you know, it needs to, because Texas needs the depth there. Uh, Jordan Whittington, you know, when he's healthy, He's a solid option at receiver. He was great. It was a great third down receiver last year. But the issue with him is he has yet to finish a football season without injury or without missing any time. And so it's hard to really rely on him. And I just kind of wonder where the mindset is of the Marcus Washingtons and the Cavante Dixons, because there's obviously an open time or an opening for them to really, you know, make a claim for not just starting, you know, playing time, but significant playing time coming off the bench if they're not the starters. It doesn't seem like either one of them's really, you know, um, answering the call there. And that's, that's definitely alarming to me. Yeah. I mean, it's, um, you know, and Jordan Whittington from what I was told coming out of Saturday's practice where there was some 
scrimmaging going on, but not, it wasn't a full blown scrimmage. Uh, Jordan Whittington was by far the standout performer in Saturday's practice. And, and that's great. Um, they've got three top end receivers, but good heavens. Um, where would they be without Isaiah Nayor? Oh my gosh. Yeah. I mean, and they, they got in on him late. I mean, barely got in, in time before they are just, you know, went off to Tennessee. So that was a, that's going to prove to be a huge pickup, much like the Xavier worthy uh, recruitment last year for Texas. So, I mean, I'm already out on that limb, so I'm just going to stay out there. <laughs> yeah, I've already said Isaiah Nair is going to be a impact player along with Ryan Watts and, and Terrence Brooks. Although maybe I should have said Jalen Gilbo because when I was looking at the corner, the cornerback reps today, it it was Deshaun Jameson and Ryan Watts, but then Jalen Gilbo rotating in with Deshaun Jameson um, with the ones, not not Terrence Brooks, not yet. It's early. And listen, we can overcook everything. Just take what we say as you know, these are practice observations, right? These are not definitive statements about who's going to be starting next season. Are you kidding me? We're four practices in the spring ball. We're just telling you who's getting reps with the ones as of today. And, and so Jalen Gilbo is another guy whose name continues to come up um, for making plays. We heard Josh Thompson come on this podcast. Hopefully everyone has now listened to that interview flagship podcast interview because he said Terrence Brooks and Jalen Gilbo were two players. He thinks can surprise because they're not here to play. They're here to learn the position and, and take this like a job. So that's, that's great news for um, Steve Sarkeesian. And uh, obviously since we're talking about young players and, and Steve Sarkeesian did mention how excited he is to be, you know, he'll get Brennan Thompson, the receiver this summer, he'll get six offensive linemen uh, coming in in June, two of whom are considered the top uh, interior and offensive tackle in the 2022 recruiting class, Calvin Banks and Devin Campbell. So, um, you know, we said that this spring was going to be sort of a glimpse uh, at most of the team, but not all of the team. And so, um, but that's exciting that you've got some young guys who are, who are making an impression on, on the defensive side of the ball. Yeah. And there's no denying that Texas needs more and more playmakers on the defensive side of the ball. If any, if last year taught you anything, it was, there was, you know, a lot of guys that were not the ones that were the every down type of players that are going to give their, their heart or play their hardest. And, um, Steve Sarkeesian did mention that it, you know, in talking about the lack of depth on offense, he also was talking about, you know, the defense has a lot more depth than um, even the offense too, because a lot of the early or mid-year or early enrollees were more on the defensive side of the ball as opposed to the offensive side of the ball. Um, and so, you know, that's that's something that Texas needs, Chip. I mean, come on, like. I, I think that, you know, I think Pete Kulkowski really got probably a little bit of a reality check of how big 12 offenses run and pretty much every defensive coordinator that I've covered at Texas, if they didn't have a very veteran group from, you know, top down, if they can because every defense coordinator I've covered came from a different conference, they didn't, you know, face big 12 offenses week in and week out. And I think that, you know, Pete Kulkowski had said that ideally last year and, you know, they keep the. Um, opposing team under, I think it was, what do you say, like 30 or something like that. And that didn't happen. But I feel like it's not only the additional bodies on defense is going to help, but also I think more and more of the familiarity with the staff with each other, but also Pete Kwiatkowski's full understanding of, okay, these big 12 offenses really are legit. It's not even, you know, comparable to what he faced in the PAC 12, you know, as the defensive coordinator um, for many years out there. So um, I think the the more young guys, especially on defense, I can step up the better. 
Uh, one interesting note I thought Steve Sarkeesian said, Ship was, you know, he kind of surprised us a little bit earlier in the year when he was talking about the secondary. And one of the things that was a little surprising was, you know, talking about the safeties, he just threw Anthony Cook's name into the safety group. Well, today he was talking about nickel and he mentioned that Anthony Cook's been working some at nickel too. And then it was asked, you know, how is the transition to safety going for, or, you know, is he still playing safety? I forget exactly how it was asked. And Sark just said, Anthony Cook's a defensive back. So I'm kind of wondering what that means, you know, kind of, I know he's, you know, he's been working out with the safeties, but what does that mean if they're not like definitive on there? Does that mean that the nickel is, you know, really um, basically diminished without him there? I don't know. I mean, that that was kind of a, one of those questions I, I put a star next to my notes on it. Like, what, what is that? What is that supposed to mean? Right. right. We know, we know Anthony Cook can handle playing the nickel and, and they do have Anthony Cook right now at safety. And today he and Keaton Crawford mm -hmm. were the first team safeties. Jody Barron was the nickel uh, throughout practice. Um, Jaron Thompson is also working at nickel uh, in addition to Anthony Cook. So uh, Jaron Thompson's also a safety. And Jaron Thompson and Maurice Blackwell were the second team safeties in today's practice. So it's, um, that's a good battle. I mean, that's, that's a good battle. There are, there are a handful of legit position battles, uh, going on this spring that I think are fascinating. Safety is definitely one of them, uh, because you lose, you know, you lose, um, you know, cool. BJ Foster, uh, Tyler Owens, Brennan Schooler, you know, Brennan Schooler, Marcus Caldwell, Chris Adamora pick, I mean, go all the way back to Xavier and Alford uh, among the guys who transferred out of the program. So the cupboard is, is almost empty at safety. You're starting over. So that is a legitimate uh, position battle to watch. And then the other corner behind where Josh Thompson just left, where it looks like right now, I mean, based on today's practice, and again, these are snapshots. We're talking about what we're seeing right now. Ryan Watts stayed out with the ones the whole day. Deshaun Jameson and Jalen Gilbo rotated on their side, um, on that side of the field at corner. So, you know, you're just watching to see how these position battles are unfolding. Another one on the offense is tight end, where, you know, I heard great things about Gunnar Helm in Saturday's practice. Gunnar Helm uh, looking more comfortable, handling the blocking making some plays downfield in the passing game. Uh, but today, the first team uh, tight ends were Jatavian Sanders and Jaleel Billingsley. And then Gunnar Helm and Braden Lybrock came in with the second team. So, look, they're getting all kinds of opportunities to show what they can do. Uh, but that tight end position is a big one uh, in terms of just being a pure position battle because Cade Brewer, Jared Wiley, gone. Now you've got, um, they're, they don't have any other options right now. They don't, they haven't indicated they're looking for a tight end in the transfer portal. Like they have looking at safety and linebacker and that kind of thing. So you've got uh, Gunnar Helm and Jatavian Sanders as the, the guys really battling it out to replace Cade Brewer as the blocking tight end on this team, which we know is the tight end that's going to be on the field the whole time because of all the things that they require the tight end to do. And the running game as a lead blocker as the motion um, guy to help the quarterback determine if the defense is in man or zone. And, and so we got real position battles going on here, Taylor. And that's, that's exciting because sometimes you come into spring and everything's all decided. Right. Yeah. Definitely not the case this year. And it's across the board too. Uh, you know, when Steve Sarkeesian did talk about the tight end position, he talked about Gunnar Hellman, Jatavian Sanders um, making, they've incrementally improved. They're not exactly where they want them to be yet, but Steve Sarkeesian does feel that seeing the progress is making them feel a little bit more comfortable about the position. When you mentioned Jaleel Billingsley chip, that's where I'm starting to really wonder, you know, with the, with Steve Sarkeesian's concern of depth at, at wide receiver 
um, how much is Jaleel Billingsley going to play a true tight end type of role? Or is he going to kind of be almost a hybrid receiver tight end type of guy? I don't know. Like, I, you know, that that's going to be, I think, something um, Steve Sarkeesian hasn't mentioned this. It's just more, you know, looking at how things are shaping up, hearing his concern about re receiver, looking at Jaleel Billingsley. He is this for the typical type of receiver, you know, six foot four, I think 214 or 211 pounds not really the tight end type of built. I'm truly um, curious to see kind of how how they utilize him, not just in spring, but moving forward, um, especially with receiver depth being, um, you know, questionable at best. Right. Troy O'Meary, as we've mentioned, um, he was out at practice today. He, he has his uniform on. He's got a brace on his right knee, but we're not seeing him in action, kind of like quarterback Malik Murphy, who, uh, finally is out of the boot from that uh, severe ankle injury he suffered in his state championship uh, victory in December. And Steve Sarkeesian was asked about Malik Murphy's, um, you know, timetable. And he said, no time soon. This was a severe ankle injury. And um, it's going to take a while for Malik Murphy to, yeah. to, to get to a point where he can be on the field, be moving. and you know, be fully cleared. And he, and that was another depth concern that he did mention was quarterback, you know, um, without having Malik Murphy, if that shows you anything about where Charles Wright is, I think on the depth chart, there's your answer right there because, you know, Sark was wanting, or, you know, they don't want to rush Malik Murphy back in, as you were saying, obviously, but he does say that Malik Murphy not being able to go through reps and anything like that right now has also, you know, been led to a depth concern at quarterback. And I can't believe we've gone this long without talking about quarterback, <laughs> but speaking of quarterback, uh, you know, still kind of rotation there. Um, and I, I, I really would love to see how Malik Murphy would fit in if he was healthy, just because, you know, we, we saw Charles Wright come in last year and he was behind a walk on. And so I think that still is, yeah, he still is for sure. And Ballard, the, the walk on third team quarterback. Yeah. <laughs> Give it up to that guy. He's not letting go of it. No, for sure. And, you know, that that's going to be interesting where Malik, you know, kind of falls in line there when he is healthy. But he did say that Malik Murphy has done a really good job in the, you know, like working in the film room and learning the playbook and that type of thing. It's just, you know, he just got to get some reps whenever he's healthy. Um, you know, that that's another concern. Uh, you know, we saw Quinn Ewers and Hudson Card a little bit today. Uh, Chip, if you didn't check out Chip's scrimmage report, from the weekend, you definitely should go to Horns 24-7, get some nuggets there. But what's your, you know, hearing, just seeing what the quarterbacks have done now in the week two, Chip, and hearing Steve Sarkeesian's comments of what he's looking for, how would you grade that position right now? Yeah, I mean, I think um, what I heard coming out of Saturday's practice was Hudson Card looks the most comfortable. He looks like QB1, which we expected. He's got the the time and experience in the offense. He's familiar with the personnel, uh, especially at receiver. Uh, although Isaiah Nayor is a new uh, addition, but obviously he's familiar with the offensive line, the running backs and the offense in general. And, and so Hudson card um, is looking more comfortable, but you can't deny uh, watching Quinn Ewers throw the football that, it's it's what you see uh, at the NFL level. I mean, it it comes out. It's it's a perfect spiral. It's on target. It's <laughs> it's beautiful. So now you just gotta hope that Quinn Ewers can digest everything because right before we were allowed into practice, uh, Quinn Ewers was intercepted in the red zone in a you know in a two minute offense drill uh, in eleven on eleven, and so. Um, look, there's going to be growing pains and Steve Sarkeesian has told his quarterbacks, I'd rather you take some chances in practice, see what you think you can do. Um, and if it proves to be a mistake, it's in practice. Once we get into a game, I don't want you, you know, testing whether you think you can fit a ball in or not. I want, I want, uh, you know, it to be more of a sure thing. So, um, I think it's going to take time. For Quinn Ewers, I think this thing is going to go into fall camp, which um, would not 
would not be a surprise, but how much can Quinn Ewers digest? How, how much of a film junkie is he, you know, does he love to watch film? Is he constantly, is he looking at opponents film already? We, we heard some of that from Casey Thompson last year that, you know, he loves to watch film. He's he, during the summer, he was watching film of big 12 defenses and, and trying to get tendencies and all that stuff. So that's the kind of commitment it takes um, to play at the highest level. And that's the kind of commitment Texas is hoping that they have in, in these two quarterbacks, because they, you know, they talked about going and getting a veteran quarterback in the transfer portal and that, that didn't materialize or it hasn't yet. And so, um, you know, they need Hudson card and Quinn Ewers uh, to, to bring it every day. Cause um, if, if you have good leadership at the quarterback position and you're, you got a playmaker there, uh, a guy, the rest of the team can get behind and believe in man, your whole team takes a significant jump in terms of, their confidence level and, uh, and just belief, you know, I mean, I always said when Vince Young walked on the field, uh, everybody, the other, you know, 21 guys who are going to be playing in that game, uh, you know, felt better about themselves and played with more confidence because they knew they had a guy who could get them out of trouble, could make incredible plays and, uh, just made everyone around him better. So I think Texas is, um, you know, hoping that Hudson card takes that jump from that presence standpoint from not only pocket presence and can he, you know, find windows in a dirty pocket, but how he carries himself and how he leads and how he's talking to guys on a water break in practice today, you know, those kinds of things. Uh, that's, those are the steps that Hudson card needs to take because he kind of reminds me a little bit of David Ash, David Ash, talented, you know, thrower of the football, quiet guy, mm -hmm. not, you know, didn't really mingle, um, with his teammates or I'll never forget major Applewhite telling me that he, David Ash was a really devout, uh, Christian was a lot of times alone in his room in his Bible and, and major Applewhite told David Ash, Hey, you know, Jesus was out amongst the sinners too. So <laughs> you might want to go spend some more time with your teammates uh, when you're not on the football field. But, um, you know, that that's the kind of step that Texas needs Hudson Card to take in terms of that presence and, and leadership. So um, I did think it was interesting today that Steve Sarkeesian felt like the energy was really good on Saturday, but not so good today. And I think we saw some of that, Taylor. Um, you know, I was told the defense had a little better day uh, at practice on Saturday. Uh, I thought today the offense had a, a pretty good day and the defense looked a little ragged. So, uh, maybe it was that big weekend with Arch Manning and Colt McCoy. I mean, Texas rolled out the carpet for this weekend and by all accounts, it was a success. I mean, from Texas's standpoint, right? I mean, they, they, they had it all going on. Arch Manning was out at the the Dell match play with Sam Ellinger. I mean, um, it was a beautiful weekend in Austin, Texas. Scotty Scheffler, the UT Longhorn, wins the thing. So uh, pretty, pretty good weekend to have Arch Manning in, right? Yeah, no doubt about it. And you're right. They did bring out, you know, Colt McCoy was on campus, uh, Sam Ellinger. I'm kind of bummed that we didn't wait to get Josh Thompson until like, say, next week, because he also was one of the former players there with Arch Manning and Sam Ellinger out at Dell Match Play. Um, yeah, I mean, it's not really surprising that the energy level was high. I think everybody in the building understands that, you know, getting a guy like Arch Manning helps could help solidify the future of Texas football. Even if you're a Quinn Ewers or a Hudson card right now, I think that you want that guy to be the person that, you know, follows your, um, your lead essentially at the quarterback position. Speaking of that, you know, you mentioned with, um, you know, if Hudson card or Quinn Ewers, you know, are they film junkies? What is, what is it that, you know, you know, Casey Thompson was looking at big 12 defenses during the summer last year um, are they those type of guys? The one thing that Casey Thompson really had to his advantage a little bit is he had Sam Ellinger to learn from because 
Casey Thompson straight up told us last season, like mid season, you know, he is, he turned into such a film junkie because he watched the way that Sam Ellinger prepared day in and day out and worked in the film room. And to me, Chip, that, that whole 2020 year with Hudson card, uh, you know, enrolling early as a true freshman and then, you know, COVID shutting everything down. I think that that could have hurt, you know, Hudson from a development of a leadership standpoint too, because he never really got to see the quarterback leadership that Sam Ellinger brought to the table. Say what you will about Sam Ellinger. You know, he wasn't the highest rated, you know, prospect coming out of high school. He wasn't the highest draft pick or anything, but the one thing that kid, nobody can question is his leadership and his will. You know, when you talk about the quarterbacks that the team wants to fight for, you know, when Sam Ellinger is getting beat up play after play, they want to fight for that guy. And, you know, Casey Thompson kind of had a little bit of a blessing in disguise. I think that he was behind Sam Ellinger for so long because he was able to kind of pick up the tendencies and learn what it takes to be a quarterback at Texas, where now Hudson Card, you know, he's the most veteran of the group. He's never had that type of role model or somebody to kind of, you know, here's the the footsteps that you need to take and here's the path that you need to follow to truly be the, you know, the main guy at Texas and the, uh, especially at a quarter at quarterback, you know, I mean, you need, you want your quarterback to be the best leader on the team. You want he him to be the one holding, you know, guys accountable. You want everyone to hold each other accountable, but I think you definitely want the quarterback to be one that when they talk, the guys listen. And I think, you know, with Quinn Ewers kind of, I know he's been on a college campus before at Ohio State, but still came in late, didn't have a normal offseason. Um, you know, he was probably just trying to, you know, remember how to spell his name half the time last year uh, while being, you know, kind of thrown in the mix after he, uh, you know, reclassified to the 2021 class and then enrolled late at Ohio State. So, you know, I think it's what I'm really curious, and I would love to hear Steve Sarkeesian talk about this, is where where Hudson Card, number one, is from the film study perspective from, you know, wanting to be the best, wanting to be in the classroom learning, um, you know, wanting to, um, you know, learn big 12 defenses in a way of Casey Thompson. I wonder where he is because what he is doing is ultimately going to impact what Quinn Ewers is probably doing too, as a younger guy who really, I mean, we call him a redshirt freshman. I consider Quinn Ewers a true freshman. I mean, I'll just be honest. Like I know he is a redshirt freshman, but he should have just enrolled literally this past January if he didn't reclassify and go to Ohio State that year. Um, you know, I it's kind of one of those things like who's the one that's going to lead the charge there? Is Hudson Card doing it or is Quinn Ewers going to have to find his own path and not really have somebody to learn for from, you know, from that standpoint away from the field? Yeah, I mean, you, at the quarterback position, especially you, you want you always want to have that pecking order where you've got your veteran, you've got, you know, a guy who's been with him for maybe a year or two um, and they've learned how to prepare uh, the right way. And certainly Hudson Card has the advantage of knowing how Steve Sarkeesian wants the quarterbacks to prepare. But again, is he the, is he the vocal guy that this team needs? Can he be that guy? And, and then Quinn Ewers, he's a, he's kind of a cool guy. I mean, that's how he's been described. Not as Steve Sarkeesian said, not too cool for school, but you know, he's cool. He doesn't, he's level-headed, doesn't let things bother him. He's pretty unflappable, great trait to have at the, at the quarterback position. And, and so, you know, you're right. I mean, that there's, that's a problem at a lot of positions with this team right now. We just mentioned safety. You got guys who are not proven themselves at the safety position and they don't have anyone to emulate. Now, you know, Jaron Thompson saw how Brennan Schooler and BJ Foster prepared, but were they even the best guys, you know, to be on the field uh, last year? I, I, one guy I'm really excited about is Jade Barron. And um, I asked Steve Sarkeesian about Jade Barron um, today. And he said, you know what? He's not six, two, he's not, 200 pounds, but the guy has great instincts. And for a smaller guy, he's a willing tackler. I, I think this guy has a little something because Taylor, one thing that uh, will stick with me about Jody Barron was we were talking to BJ Foster last year about his interception against Arkansas. And he said that it was Jody Barron who told him what play was coming. 
Mm-hmm. And and then BJ makes the interception. It leads to a touchdown. I'm sitting there thinking, why isn't Jade Barron on the field more? You know, this guy knows what's coming. He's studying. He knows he knows what to look for. So I'm excited to see what Jade Barron brings. I don't care if he's playing nickel or safety or whatever. I just I get the feeling the guy and, you know, the pro football focus uh, numbers show that he was one one of the more productive players on the entire defense when he was on the field. He just wasn't on the field that much. Kind of like, you know, Anthony Cook, when there were times they'd go to three linebackers and take Cook off the field. You got to get your best players on the field. And hopefully we're starting to see that with uh, with this, you know, team this year. But again, like you said, there are some positions tight end. You don't have a veteran tight end now. Mm-hmm. You got Gunnar Helm and Jatavian Sanders out there trying to figure it out. You know, they saw Cade Brewer last year, but they don't have a guy in the room saying, this is how we do it. Yeah. And so Jeff Banks is going to have to lead that group. They're going to have to be a coach led group unless Gunnar Helm or Jatavian Sanders proves to be, um, you know, beyond their years in terms of maturity and being able to digest everything. So, you know, this Texas football program is, is under construction and we knew that. We knew that as soon as Steve Sarkeesian said we could have up to, you know, 30, 33 new players, third of your roster changing over. So it's it's a rebuild and that's what it is. And the coaches are going to have to keep instilling this culture. Uh, it, it wasn't done in year one, not even close. Um, I don't know what that was in year one. And so they're going to have to, you know, here this is take two, you know, if we were in Hollywood, it'd be like, okay, let's try that again. Yeah. It's still in culture. Take two. And you've got a handful of positions on this team where you don't have veterans, um, you know, handing down the culture, laying down the law in terms of how things are going to be done. So let's see how, how talented these young players are. I mean, one more quick nugget on young players, Justice Finkley was getting reps with the ones he wears. Number one, I'm sorry. If you're, if you play on the defensive line and you wear number one, you better be a monster. You better be a monster. (laughs) You better be a monster. Cause my man, storm and Norman Watkins, you know, wore number one as a linebacker. And he's like, I mean, wearing number one as a linebacker, Jesse Armstead back, you know, for those who remember the late eighties, he wore number one kind of wanted, made everyone want to wear number one. Justice Finkley's wearing number one on the defensive line. That's big time. Let's see it. But he was getting reps uh, with the ones as an edge rusher. And Baron Sorrell, we got to mention him again, Taylor, because uh, that's another name I wrote about in the brew as someone to keep an eye on. And he was, they were running a four-man line today, Ovia Gofu at one end, um, Baron Sorrell at the other, and you had Alfred Collins and Keandre Coburn as uh, the first defensive tackles getting reps with the ones. Tefandre Sweat also got rep- reps with the ones. Byron Murphy, but um, Baron Sorrell, he was getting uh, most of the reps uh, with the ones along with Ovia Gofu. So, you know, some names to keep an eye on. Yeah, there's a lot of them too. Definitely a lot of those names. And just real quick on the tight end thing. I mean, while there's no denying that, you know, losing Cade Brewer especially um, definitely does not help the position. But if there's any coach that is going to be a coach-led position type of coach, it's probably Jeff Banks. I mean, players really respond to him. Um, I remember when he Yeah, he's a fiery type of – he's in your face, but not to a point where it's disrespectful. It's it's a – very respectable level that um and relationship he has with his players he if you watch him out it's kind of fun i don't know if you've uh this is a random thought i don't know if you've ever watched him out of practice but i've watched him a number of times because where we're allowed to stand a lot of times the tight ends are right there and he's probably the most hands-on coach one of the most hands-on coach from from my perspective i should say out there and so you know i think as if they can take on his personality at the tight end position then that only helps. Uh, The one thing that the tight end room does have is Jaleel Billingsley, who has known what the culture that Steve Sarkeesian, or that, you know, what, what is expected of Jeff from Jeff Banks and Steve Sarkeesian from his time when he was at Alabama learning from them. I know he was, you know, younger and didn't play 
very long for them, but still he, he already kind of knows that too. You know, this is a good opportunity, I think for him to kind of be that quote unquote, like veteran or the older, you know, voice in the room to kind of set the guys straight of this is how we do things. This is how we did it at Alabama. This is how we won a national championship at Alabama. And this is how this position needs to go in this offense. Um, you know, I, I, not that that's really fair, I guess you could say to ask of him since he's a mid-year enrollee, but he is the most, you know, he has the most experience um, with these coaches though too, which is kind of crazy to say, but he does, you know? And so um, that's going to be, uh, it would only help the position. I think if, you know, he kind of steps up and takes over that veteran voice and leadership. I was trying to think who was the last person that wore number one on, I feel like. Keenan Robinson wore it. Keenan, but, that's then, right. but then I think he, well, he wore it. Yeah. Um, I felt like there was one other, uh, oh, Shiro Davis. Didn't he wear it? Oh yeah. Wow. Look at you pulling Shiro Davis out of the archives. <laughs> Where did that come from? How <laughs> that? Said that name since you left. <laughs> wow. I'm a sponge. I'm a sponge, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, I know we will get to uh, love it or leave it. Just real quick, um, a couple of nuggets on a couple other sports. Uh, you know, women's basketball. Vic Schaefer and um, that team. What a fun team to watch, and what a season. I hate talking about officiating, but my God, um, those officials took what uh, uh, Tara Vanderveer from Stanford, the coach, saying we don't want this to be a football game or a rugby game, and they just whistled that game to death. And, I mean, even Stanford's star player, Cameron Brink, was in foul trouble. Lauren Ebo, Aaliyah Moore, there wasn't a big on the floor who wasn't in foul trouble. They took the game away from the players. It sucked. Uh, Texas was in that game, had a chance to win it, ended up losing because all their players were fouling out. I mean, it, it was just pitiful. But what a great season. Two star freshmen emerge. Rory Harmon, the point guard, Big 12 freshman of the year. Aaliyah Moore is going to be a star. She was huge for Texas in the postseason. And who knows? We'll see if if Texas gets any super seniors back. They could get, um, I mean, Joanne Allen Taylor, uh, Audrey Warren, and Lauren Ebo all have the option of coming back as super seniors. We'll see. Um, but Vic is recruiting at a high level, two straight elite eights and a big 12 tournament title this year. Awesome, awesome stuff. And, and Chris Beard is going to lose his assistant, uh, Yurik Malagy, uh, who came with him from Texas tech, who's going to join Jerome Tang staff at Kansas state. So he'll be replacing an assistant coach, but, he gets news that Christian Bishop, who was his best uh, inside player at six foot seven, uh, is going to return for a super senior year. So that's fantastic. Brock Cunningham's coming back, so he'll have he'll have two guys who really embody his, you know, tenacious, uh, gritty, defensive minded approach. And um, and Texas baseball uh, tough weekend at in Lubbock, but to me the good news is Lucas Gordon continues to look good in that Sunday starter role that they've had to adjust with the loss of Tanner Witt to uh, Tommy John surgery. So, you know, they'll settle in kind of like UT softball has settled in. They finally got their roles, Haley Dolcini uh, as the starter, Estelle check um, at, you know, as the number two pitcher. And then Sophia Simpson, the freshman who's already thrown a no hitter this year. They've won 10 in a row after, you know, falling below 500, uh, and losing six games in a row at one point. So uh, I think when you talk uh, baseball, softball, it's constantly about adjusting to roles. And what can you say about Ivan Melendez and Murphy Staley? Those guys continue to rake. It's it's unbelievable. Um, I mean, both those teams are fun to watch right now. And Eddie Reese, uh, Texas men swimming and diving. I know they went into the NCAA championships number one, but they have battled Cal. How about this, Taylor? Texas and Cal have finished one, two in every NCAA meet that's been held since 2014. Wow. And Cal had the swimmers who outperformed their qualifying this time around. Texas had some young performers who didn't, you know, match the veteran uh, swimmers from Cal. So uh, kudos to Cal. Cause that's, that's one of the best rivalries going in all of college sports. No one talks about it, but 
those two teams have finished one, two at the NCAs uh, every year that there's been an NCA meet since 2014. So Taylor, you ready for some love it or leave it? I am. Before we get to love it or leave it, we're going to take a really quick break, but stick around because as always, football talk never ends here on the flagship podcast. So stay tuned. We will be right back. And if you're watching us on the Horns 24-7 YouTube channel, we will roll on here. Chip, you ready for some love it or leave it? Let's do it. All right. My first one for you is love it or leave it. The player you're most excited about after four spring practices is on offense. You know what? I'm going to leave this. What? You're not going with your guy, Isaiah Nair? I for sure thought I mean, I'm excited about him, but I already know he's going to be good. Mm, okay. Um, you know what? And I'm, I, I, everyone's going to say, oh, he's going to say Ryan Watts, a six foot three corner. You know what? I'm, I'm a little off the beaten path here. I'm, I'm with Jade Barron right now. I want to see this guy get his shot because something tells me he's one of those guys, one of those glue guys that can help settle this secondary down. I think Jade Barron's going to give you max effort at all times. I think he's going to get you. Uh, he's going to be lined up where he's supposed to be lined up. I think he and Anthony Cook have good communication. And I think that's really going to help this secondary. This secondary was a mess last year when things, as Josh Thompson even said in our flagship podcast interview, when you know everyone was on the same page with the game plan going into games. And then as things changed, as the game wore on, especially in the second half, and adjustments had to be made and communication was at a premium, the communication fell off and the defense fell off. Something tells me that, you know, guys like Jade Barron, Anthony Cook are going to help get this secondary settled down, especially if you're talking about having some young guys in that or new guys, I should say, you know, Ryan Watts, uh, Jalen Gilbo, possibly rotating with Deshaun Jameson at corner. You got to have steady voices back there and i i think anthony cook and jade baron are are two guys that need to be those steady voices uh in the back of the defense taylor so i'm gonna i'm gonna leave this well plenty of time to talk about the quarterbacks and how wonderful um you know the spirals are from hudson card and quinn ewers let's give some love to the to the little guys how about you um i'm also going to leave it but i'm going to go with who I thought you would probably, if you were picking a defense guy and Ryan Watts, just because I've always loved the big corners. I feel like, um, you know, some of the better corner back play that I've seen in my career covering Texas. Now I'm not talking all time, so don't <laughs> hold me that, but in, you know, uh, my last several years covering Texas has been when they've had big corners. And I just really, I've always liked the big body type of corners. I feel like in, I mean, you obviously need speedy corners in the big 12, but um, there's a lot of speed at receiver and there's a lot of size at receiver in the big 12. And, you know, sometimes there are height limitations. And I think Deshaun Jameson kind of fell into that. He was picked on a little bit last year. Um, he's obviously a very talented athlete, but you know, when you're five foot, barely five foot 10, I mean, he may be listed at five ten. I don't think he, I would be surprised if he, he's, he's pretty short, you know, um, when, you know, there's, there's certain things you can't overcome a lot of times, you know, I mean, it was just like when you used to watch Colin Johnson, a little Jordan Humphrey go against some of these corners, you know, I remember there was a picture at, at the, I guess it would have been the USC game in 2018. And there was a picture of Colin Johnson going up for a, a ball and like the corner tried. So you could tell he's in the air and Colin Johnson had well over a foot above his head with well over a foot above his hands, his hands and head. So, you know, I think that I love the big corners. I think um, you know, I think it can translate well to the NFL too. As you look at Chris Boyd, I mean, he's, he's, you know, still on NFL roster and, um, he was one of those kind of bigger corners. So yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to dis or I'm going to leave it and go with Ryan Watts as somebody I'm most excited about, um, after four pr spring practices and also after the winter conditioning, I mean, you know, in talking to honestly, in talking to sources, there's, there's some, uh, murmurs out there that Deshaun Jameson better step it up or he could be the, the, you know, odd man out a little bit with some of these guys that Texas has, has brought in. A lot of the people they were talking about there was Ryan Watts, uh, Jalen Gilbo and Terrence Brooks. And so, um, yeah, I think it's going to be really interesting to see Ryan Watts. Um, I'm really excited to see that. And I'm also excited to see kind of what happens 
on the opposite side, if uh, Deshaun Jameson can kind of secure that starting role or if he's going to get, you know, jumped by a younger guy, it's going to be yeah, another, and battle, Ryan, another position battle. <laughs> and Ryan Watts, when you see him, I mean, he looks like a linebacker. Well, he looks like a receiver yeah. or a linebacker. I mean, he's just a bigger guy. It's, um, it's impressive. So let's hope he, he can, uh, provide the sticky coverage that Steve Sarkeesian was saying. He said, we need to be stickier in coverage. I, I think he wants his corners to play up and play some man and, and, you know, have guys who aren't afraid to be on the Island so that they can do whatever they got to do to bring more heat on the quarterback. But uh, good call, Taylor. Uh, love it or leave it. Number two. My second one is love it or leave it. The lack of depth on offense at positions like offensive line and receiver are big time concerns right now. Yeah. I mean, I think we have to love this because I could tell from Steve Sarkeesian's expression today that, you know, when you're talking about limiting the number of scrimmages you're going to have in the spring because you don't have the bodies and you you're counting on these guys to run all these plays in practice. You know, you've talked about it a lot with Joseph Osai. They used to monitor him. Uh, he would go so hard in practice, they'd have to pull him out so that he wouldn't, you know, over overextend himself and, and make himself injury prone. Uh, this is a concern and it's not even hot yet um, this spring and Texas started late. It's going to get hot. And with the spring game, April 23rd, we're heading into those uh, days where it's going to be in the nineties and you're out there two hours. You just don't want those muscle strains. In fact, after the first practice, Taylor, we noticed that Juan Davis and Jameer Johnson were off on the, you know, working with the green jerseys and I asked Steve Sarkeesian about it and he was like uh it's just a muscle strain but we're being really precautionary and now we know why because he he just doesn't have the numbers and and so I think this is a, a real concern and it hurts the team I mean look you're not going to be able to be as physical you're not going to have as much scrimmage situations where you're able to go all out because you, the last thing you need is for Jordan Whittington or Isaiah Nair or one of these defensive backs to um, one of these safeties to, to, you know, pull a hamstring that is slow to recover. So um, I think we have to love this. How about you? Yeah, I definitely think you have to love it. And that, you know, again, that doesn't, hasn't really changed much since prior, you know, entering the off season, I would say, I think that offensive line and receiver have been two positions that you and I have talked at length about, um, there being depth concerns, obviously, um, offensive line is probably still the, I mean, it, it's going to be, it's kind of one of those things where it's like, until I see it with my own eyes, I'm not going to believe that the offensive line has improved just because I feel like it just, it's just kind of been in that stuck place, regardless of who the coach has been honestly on the offensive line. Um, and you know, it's still there. There's limited depth. I know that they're getting six guys in, in the summer, but again, what coach out there wants to be forced to rely on true freshmen, offensive linemen, not many. You definitely don't want multiple. Well, and to your point, that's a great point. And this is a golden opportunity for a guy like Andre Carrick. Yes. Because they've moved Christian Jones over to the right tackle. Everybody thinks they've done that to clear the way for Calvin Banks or Devin Campbell to come in and become the left tackle. Okay, well, Andre Carrick, prove everybody wrong. Mm -hmm. take the job. You're not going to get a better opportunity to be the left tackle at Texas than you have right now. And he should be, you know, pouncing at this opportunity. I just wanted to throw that in there because he's still working at left tackle um, with the limited depth right now. Yeah, no. And that's a great point. I mean, that's the other thing too, is coaches don't want to be forced to rely on a true freshman offensive lineman. And then imagine if you're a guy like an Andre Carrick or like some of these other guys that have been on campus a few years, do you really want to be so far behind that a true freshman comes in and people are just chalking them up to be the starter? I mean, it, you know, I said this last week and um, it was a little harsh, but still like have some pride in, in yourself and your ability and, um, you know, show that fire. You want offensive linemen to be the nasty, fiery guys out there. 
And if you're not fired up enough when you have this golden opportunity to really, you know, secure a starting job on an offensive line that needs a lot of improvement, then maybe you're playing the wrong sport, you know? So, um, yeah, I'm going to want those guys to be the most feared guys on the team. Exactly. Like when they walk in the room, you're like, yeah, you definitely don't want to like run into them in the back alley or dark alley or anything. You know, those are the guys that you see their stature, like run the opposite way. And I feel like some of the offensive linemen at Texas has been honestly the whole time I've covered them. They're more the teddy bears. We want to run in and give them a hug more so than run the other way. So show that fire. No need um, teddy bears, Taylor. Yeah. <laughs> We need feared barbarians. Exactly. Exactly. It's like guys that may not know how to spell their name, but my goodness, when that ball is snapped, they're going to eat whoever is in front of them. <laughs> yeah, you and I used to do radio with a guy named Mike Rosenthal, and he said, you got to have a few guys with some screws loose. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Every team needs some of those guys, and you need them usually right up front. Um, all right. Love it or leave it, number three. All right, my final one is love it or leave it. The search for an edge rusher who can get pressure on the quarterback will be someone other than Ovi Agofu. You know what? I'm gonna no offense to Ovi Agofu, but I I'm gonna I'm gonna love this. Um obviously if O'Shawn Mathis, when he graduates from TCU in May, if he picks Texas, we'll probably have our answer to this. Um, but as of right now, I think they are looking and I thought it was interesting today, Taylor, Steve Sarkeesian said, I underestimated the impact of Jacoby Jones and his injury against Oklahoma. Uh, he didn't return until the Kansas state game, the final game of the regular season. And Jacoby Jones made some plays in that game and made some plays obviously before he was injured in the OU game and, and had a good camp last year and they've got to find um an impact guy i mean again if it's oshawn mathis if he picks texas and transfers and comes in in june he'll immediately be uh, pegged as a preseason all-conference type of player but let's see a guy like baron sorrell who has long arms who has a motor who wants it and is now up to 253 pounds Let's see if he can emerge. Okay, Justice Finkley, Prince Dorba. Where are you, Prince Dorba? My God, he had three sacks in the spring game, and we never saw him on the field in the fall. And it's because everyone you talk to says he's comfortable. He's good. And that's what happens sometimes. Guys are big-time playmakers in high school. They get to Texas. Life is good. Um, they're not burning, you know, to – to get to the NFL from the moment they, they get there. Plus they see guys ahead of them. They think, Oh, it's not my time anyway. Okay. Now it's your time. Now there's opportunity. So let's see it. Prince Dorba got reps with the ones today too, which is great. It's great news. I mean, let's see what he can do with that. So I'm going to, I'm going to love this for right now, Taylor. How about you? Um, and that's hard because you know, when you do mention Osha Mathis and bring him into the mix, I think that, you're right. That, that would be the answer. And, you know, we won't know about his decision until after he graduates from TCU this spring, but uh, I, I'm going to take that out of the equation for now. And I am going to leave it. And I'm going to say that, you know, Ovia Gofu, while I feel like, I feel like you saw him start to get better and better as the year wore on last year. And that was on a defense that really struggled to get pressure um, on opposing quarterbacks. And that's not just the edge rushers position or, you know, um, responsibility. It's the defensive line. And then it's also, you know, making sure that the secondary is in good coverage too, to where it gives the defensive line more time to pressure the quarterback. You know, um, if, if the corners or safeties were getting burned every play last year or a lot of the plays, and it's just a quick release for the quarterbacks, you're not going to get much pressure on the quarterback because you don't have time to get to him. So, you know, I, I think that Ovia Gofu, um, you know, I, there was a lot of times where big plays were made, and I feel like he was always kind of in the vicinity. And so I, I'm going to give him the benefit of the doubt here and say that he's going to take that, you know, progress that he started to show more and more as the year wore on last year, another year under Bo Davis in the same defensive scheme. And um, I think I think I'm going to I'm going to give him the benefit benefit of the doubt and say that 
you know, without Osha Mathis on the the table at all right now with the roster they have, the roster they have coming in, the guys that they have coming in, I'm going to say Ovia Gofu is the, the edge rusher that's going to step up. Okay. All right. Let me, let me throw one at you. Okay. Since it was uh, arch madness this past weekend. Uh, love it or leave it. Texas is seriously in the mix for arch Manning. Yeah, I, I would love that. I think um, if you did not listen to the state of recruiting podcast earlier in the week, uh, we actually recorded one with Mike and Hudson um, on Sunday night, right after the big visit weekend. Um, go Hudson ahead. Standish, not Hudson Carr. Oh, yeah, Hudson Standish. Sorry, Mike Roach and Hudson Standish. Uh, but yeah, if you once you finish this, go over there and listen to that because they had a lot of intel in there. And then also Mike and uh, Hudson Standish also put stuff out you know, coming out of the weekend. But yeah, I think that Texas did a really good job from everything that it sounds like. You know, I think Steve Sarkeesian's approach of being a little bit more laid back with him is something that that fits what Arch Manning is looking for. You know, he's, he's a very um, low-key type of, you know, guy. I mean, I, I would say when, when we had Riley Dodge on here, him talking about Quinn Ewers being kind of just that like even keeled, low-key, like he just likes to hunt and fish and, hang out with his buddies and play football type of thing. I feel like Arch Manning, you know, he has this, this uh, like aura around him and everyone around him is like, oh my gosh, is this some like mythic, you know, mythical like type of like creature or something that's not even real or, and it's, you know, he's just not that type of person. He's more looking for, you know, where he feels at home. And I think Texas is honing in on that and trying to make Austin sell itself, which it sounds like from, you know, everything coming out of the weekend is he really likes Austin. And so let the city sell yourself. I think that's what the coaching staff does. So, yeah, I think I would love that 100% that Texas is definitely in the mix with him right now. Now, that does not mean that Texas is signing him or he, you know, silently committed or anything like that. Like, so keep that out of here. But, yeah, I think, I mean, they definitely did not hurt themselves this weekend. What about you? Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm going to love it, too. I think – um I think Arch Manning is absolutely uh, thinking long and hard about Texas, and and that's uh, that's exciting. And I and I think this weekend um, only helped mm -hmm. in that cause, and and so we'll see we'll see how it plays out from here. We know that uh, from every indication, Arch Manning would like to make a decision before his uh, football season begins in. Um, late August. So we shall see exciting times. Arch building, madness here. <laughs> arch madness. Uh, building blocks. And by the way, I I think I'm I might be right outside the top 10 in our horns 24 7 March madness bracket. Oh, I'm I'm out for sure. Okay. I picked uh Gonzaga, so there. I had North Carolina and Kansas in the final four. With Kansas winning it all, so we'll see. Oh, maybe. Big 12 homer here. <laughs> They're heating up, too. They're heating up. Did They're he heating up. At like 26 points or something. <laughs> yeah. Watch out, baby. Big 12 uh, lives on. <laughs> all right. Uh, hey, everybody. Thanks for listening. Good times. Love talking football. Football season never ends here on the flagship podcast. So thanks for for jumping in with us and uh, make sure you check out all the podcasts. As we mentioned, um, we did not do a uh, flagship podcast interview for Monday because of Arch Madness. Yep. So make sure you check out Mike Roach and Hudson Standish on the state of recruiting and, um, and get all the latest on where Arch Madness stands. So for Taylor Estes, I am Chip Brown. We'll see you over at horns247.com. Until next time, stay safe and keep the faith.